Thank you. As the historian in this interdisciplinary project, I study the written sources for Ireland and Scotland and the territorial units and place names of the hinterlands around the project's central places in Munster, Dalryada and Pictland. I aim to place this in an international context so we can produce an analysis integrated with the archaeological and environmental research. I'm currently undertaking a literature review which is showing how scholars interpret Ireland and Scotland differently. Both countries, both countries have generally been regarded as peripheral to the core of European development, thought to be best represented by England and Francia. Scotland has been considered a successful, if as Gordon showed, baffling uh, case of state formation, with a unified kingdom of the Picts being the precursor of the later medieval kingdom of the Scots, and hence Scotland. While Ireland has been regarded as politically divided, unstable and backward, retaining hundreds of kingdoms with competing royal kindreds into the 12th century. However, recent scholarship for both countries has been moving in opposite directions to each other. In Ireland, historians like Don Caroin have increasingly argued for the development of powerful early medieval kingdoms which suppressed minor polities, employing taxation and officials to dominate their realms more comprehensively, especially from the 10th century onwards. The importance of the church working alongside kings and encouraging economic development has also been stressed. In Scotland, in contrast, scholars used to argue for substantial royal, uh, early royal government, reflected in officials such as the Morvair, uh, the precursor to the later medieval earl, and also a figure called the Thane, who's a local official, um, according to some scholars. But recently, um, scholars such as Alex Wolfe, Dovett Brune, and Alice Taylor have convincingly proposed that by the early 12th century, these were not royal officials, but the leaders of local kindreds, chosen from their regional power bases. The Kingdom of the Scots at this time was ruled by the king through the aristocracy, rather than in spite of it, as often is the, the view. So scholarship on kingship and governance seems in these countries to have switched viewpoints. But what was the reality? It is difficult to undertake a comparison between Ireland and Scotland because there is such a greater abundance of evidence, both textual and archaeological, surviving for Ireland rather than, than you can see for Scotland. However, if we bring the fragments of surviving evidence together for Scottish history and utilise developing fields in archaeology and landscape history and place names uh, in which the evidence of the disciplines overlap, it becomes possible to produce comparative material. So we can consider individual texts, which I'll be doing uh, to some extent, um, and these do provide us with some important evidence. So for instance, in the life of St. Columba, uh, written at the end of the seventh century AD by Adlathnan, uh, abbot of Iona, there are a number of episodes involving kings, including an interesting group about Pictland, focused on the Pictish king, Brithe, son of Maelchon. Uh, this is a potential gold mine for, of evidence for uh, Brithe and his power centre, including this um, episode, which is in Book 2, Chapter 33, when Columba was staying with the Pictish king, Brithe, and saves the life of the wizard, Broichan, to free a slave girl. In this episode, as you can see from the highlighted texts, there is a fortress with a house, a hall, and also a place for royal treasures. It also includes information about people linked with Brithe. There is the wizard Broichan, uh, who's uh, described as Brithe's foster father. There are Brithe's familiares, his household members, who have considerable status since they and Brithe sent the messengers on horseback to Columba. We can therefore create a picture of a court government with a king and his key supporters around him. And elsewhere, the text has a sub-king of the Orkneys in attendance with Brithe. These people presumably helped Brithe make uh, important decisions of the realm as well as being his subordinates. While there are issues with 
the use of this material, as with any hagiographical text, it is presumably a re relatively plausible depiction in this uh, account, since there was a Pictish audience to the text, and Adathnan had visited Pictland. I think it's very likely that he was, as someone who had subordinate monasteries there, that he would have been visiting at least once or twice. It may therefore tell us about the situation in the late 7th century. Uh, it may tell us more about the situation in the late 7th century than about the 6th century when Columba was writing, but it's still very useful for us. Unfortunately, our written evidence for early medieval Scotland, as I say, is very sparse, so we often can't draw definite conclusions from it. Steve Driscoll has argued uh, from the written sources and the archaeology that after 700, there was a shift from hilltop sites like Brithays and Dundurn, uh, which you can see here, to less defensive, low-lying sites with connections with, to the church, uh, like for Teviot and Schoon in, in Perthshire. But at least with the texts, we cannot be um, sure whether the apparent decline in references to forts is due to the changing nature of our sources, as the main source for the forts, the Irish Chronicles, provides very few details at all about any places after 740, when the Iona Chronicle ceases to be a major component. And instead, what we find is that we get, uh, we get uh, overall, in our Scottish evidence, we get more evidence for non-military places uh, and events, such as where laws were being promulgated or where a king died, because the sources we have are increasingly uh, about the deaths of kings and where they're enacting events. So we then get the sources that are about non-defensive sites. So what we find is there's a shift in the evidence type away from sources that are going to tell us about hill forts to type sources about have a wider range of places. So in effect, the written sources are not going to be the answer to our, our question about the change in uh, use of central places. And only archaeological investigation can determine whether the shift suggested by Driscoll was a real one and how much of a change that was. Another subject i uh, be um, considering in this project is the land units used in different regions and how they reflect territories, social structures and methods of taxation and renders and other types of governance. This might help us understand whether structures of governance were based on kinship, as in kin groups, not kingship, um, clientship, or local communities, how stable or fluid uh, local society was, what levels of society had kings or different types of rulers, and how resources were redistributed from the general population to elites. For Ireland, Paul McCotter has argued that in the 12th century, uh, there, there was a hierarchy of kings ruling territories of different sizes the smallest of which was what he calls the local kingdom, uh, the Tuas. So this is the left-hand side here. The, sorry, the local kingdom, uh, which is the Chica uh, There are about 180 of these in Ireland. Below that was the Tuath, uh, led by the non-royal Taishach Tuatha, and who, Paul Makota argues, had very little real power by this time. Makota argues that the Tuath was not ruled even around about 700 on the right-hand side uh, by a, a king, um, but I'm not sure that he's correct about this. Uh, the evidence is probably indicates that there were some who were kings, some who were not uh, earlier on. Smaller than the Tuath was the Balia Biatef, a key unit focused on the kin group, which provided food renders and military service to the Trikich Ked uh, kings. Makota argues that the equivalent of the Balia Biatef uh, in uh, 700 was the Koikrath Cheda. Sorry about all the names, um, but you can see that one's there, uh, the Koikrath Cheda. Uh, this is a unit, it's described in the legal text as a, le a unit with five rats, the five rats being ring forts, uh, which are found abundantly, as, as Gordon said, around the Irish countryside and were probably, in the whole, on the whole, uh, usually occupied by free commoner farmers. The early Irish legal texts state that, in contrast, that uh, they describe kings as having <coughs> dunes, uh, duns, ring forts, which presumably had a higher number of ring ditches, and this was a marker of social status. Kings provided cattle to farmers uh, as 
part of their clientship relationship. And they had base clients who, who were in this sort of relationship. And in exchange for the cattle, they gave the, the farmers gave food renders annually um, and also cattle and also labor service, including digging the ditches around the royal uh, dunes, among other duties. Dune is the same word that is used for fortresses in Pictland, uh, in our sources, and also happens to be used as the word for often the fortresses in Ireland too. So what I'll be doing is looking at how this word has different connotations or similar connotations in the different case study areas. It has been argued by Paul McCotta, uh, John Bannerman and Alastair Ross, who are two, two Scottish historians, that some of this Irish structure was also the same in Pictland and the later Scottish Kingdom. In particular, scholars have equated the Balyabirdach with the Scottish unit called the Davach on, on the right hand side, regarding it similarly as a compact economic unit uh, which was a multiple estate. In the 12th century, the Davach was a unit used for raising the common burdens for the crown. These were army service, financial and military aid and military campaigns, and also labor services on buildings like castles and bridges. The Davach certainly dates to the 11th century, but might be dated earlier. Um, the argument is usually that it's Pictish. The word is Gaelic, meaning vat, um, in those Irish Gaelic sources, but it's much debated whether it relates to an arable food render or unit or something else. I follow Alistair Ross in viewing it as relating to both arable and pastoral farming, probably originally referring to a mixed render uh, to the value of that vat or whatever containers it is, uh, its contents. In addition to the Davach in the Kingdom of the Scots, there was also a local figure I've mentioned before, the Thane, uh, comes in the sources of Latin, Thanus. This is in Gaelic sources, the Toishech. Uh, so naturally, scholars have linked this to the Irish Toishech who ruled the Tuath in Ireland. This can all fit an argument that Scotia uh, and the successor of Pictland, uh, and therefore Pictland itself, shared a fundamentally similar territorial and social pattern with Ireland. But there are problems with this. First, in some cases, Davos uh, can be divided into separate parts distributed about the parish. So this is a picture of one parish. I haven't marked them all, but they all have uh, multiple parts dotted around. So a Davos could be divided into different sections. In contrast, in Ireland, the Balyabirdach is usually a single unit uh, instead. So the other difference is that while the Balyabida uh, is often the basis for the later parish, although not always, the Davos are always the subunit of the parish. And so uh, we seem to be seeing something different. In addition to this, we get um, often in Ireland Balyabida units have the place name element Bala, which is the first part of Balyabida uh, in the, the, the name of that unit. But while Balia was also introduced into Scotland, as you can see on the left-hand map, uh, and is found in many cases, it seems to have been introduced in the late 11th century and 12th centuries, exactly roughly around the same time. Um, you don't see the Davach having a, the place name element Balia in these names of these units. They do sometimes have the element uh, Pet, uh, which is, seems to be a share of land, or some units of some sort, size. And also, often it's just you, the name of the Davach is, can be just a general place name, presumably a more central place in that um, small uh, Davach. So what we see, therefore, is a, a difference in terms of the names. And also, it is noticeable that place name scholars in Scotland would regard Balia as meaning a settlement, whereas uh, in Ireland, Makota uh, argues that it is a land unit and the settlement is a secondary, uh, uh, well, actually the original usage, and then it becomes a land use, and then becomes a settlement term again. So it does seem as if there seem, we need to investigate this more, but the Scottish Davok does seem to be, although it has some similarities to the Balia Bidach, there are some key differences too. In addition to this, we do have some other general differences between Ireland and uh, Scotland. Most notably, as Gordon mentioned, 
after the references to lesser kings in Alba and Pictland cease in the middle of the 8th century, only kings of the Picts or Alba appear in sources. So the kingdom of the Picts becomes around about, from 900 onwards, they're called the kings of Alba. That's, so if I'm switching, that's why they, they basically get renamed and become, <laughs> becomes a Gaelic kingdom rather than Pictish. So, but under the kings of, the, uh, of Alba, there is also a regional lord called the Morvair, um, which you can see. Uh, sorry, this is death. Hasn't moved on. Uh, from, yeah, it didn't move on before, sorry. Let's see. Do I need to? Do? That? Yeah. Do you want to try my click on it? Yeah. You put this in and then turn this on. Okay. It might work. Sorry, you've not been on the right picture for, for a minute or so. I hadn't realized that. It's only one span. Any joy? Are you using the Oh, it's moving on the laptop from that. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't realize. Oh. Now you have to drag it and drop it onto the other screen if you use extend. Oh, it's a duplicate. Right? You keep it on this. This one, yeah. No, no, it's um, two up. Two up. This one. This one on the top left. This, this. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I should run off. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so what we have in uh, the Kingdom of Alba is this figure uh, known as the Morver, um, who is a regional lord, which means the word is Gaelic, means great or sea steward. Whatever the situation was, when we start to get this figure much more often, and other figures at around about 1100, it is likely that this position was initially an appointed one. And as Dovit Brun has argued, we can infer that there was an earlier stage um, before the Morvair, uh, which was probably already, uh, had already, the stage had already been reached by about 700 AD, when there's a, a figure called the Maya, um, a steward uh, found in Pictland. Uh, we can guess this from one or two place names. While I'm still researching, while I'm still researching whether there were similar positions in Ireland, uh, including whether the Maya, the Mura, and the Rechter that we find in Irish sources are anything to do similar at all with the, to the um, Scottish ones, at the moment it does seem that the officials in Pictland seem to be a significant difference from Ireland. What explains the comparative lack of kings in Pictland and Alba in comparison to Ireland? Was the geography an environment of eastern Scotland more suited to political centralisation, perhaps favouring hill forts which could dominate localities, enabling elites to consolidate wider polities. Did the agricultural economy of eastern Pictland, with arable lands near the coast, uh, and a just relatively discreet but um, a sub still substantial uh, highland area, um, but with valleys that uh, are quite uh, they're accessible from each other, but they're still quite, they're not really isolated, but they're still quite discreet. Um, did this sort of landscape play a role too? In contrast, what we see in Ireland is generally more low-lying lands with coastal and riverine waterways as well. And overall, it's likely that you could travel around, if you had a kingdom in one place, you could be attacked from lots of directions, more than you would be able to in Scotland. And also the access and landscape in general is more accessible. So making it perhaps a bit more difficult for a smaller polity to expand and defend against all of its competitors. In addition to this, there is the other, other possibilities, which I, there are lots of different policy, possibilities, but one of the major ones is polity competition. The obvious competitors to the Picts were the English Northumbrians who dominated Pictland until the Battle of Nechtensmere in uh, AD 685 when they were defeated and driven out. And earlier on, the Romans, who may have altered local power structures and ideology significantly. Did such interventions favor a few larger kingdoms able to compete 
uh, while suppressing local local royal polities, even if the effects of this were perhaps only noticed centuries later. Overall, the comparative approach is uh, brings up a lot of questions, I think, about how Ireland and Scotland compare with each other and also the rest of Europe. Combining disciplinary approaches is the key to success, enabling us to test interpretations and to build up a better picture of how kingship and governance develop. Thank you.